Hi there, I'm Judith from Just Jude Designs and this is my free tutorial on how to make these cute hexi baskets. Now in this tutorial I will be teaching you the English paper piecing technique also known as EPP and that's how we make these um, little hexagon panels on the outside of the baskets. I'll also be showing you how to make and attach piping along the bottom here and that's what gives these little baskets their shape and definition as well as how to finish the construction of the basket. And then at the end of the tutorial, I will be showing you a formula that you can apply to make any size basket that you want. So if you want them bigger or smaller, um, whatever size you want them to be, I will show you how you can work out what size base you need to make and what size side panel you need to make. So let's get sewing. There are two ways that you can make your hexi papers. One, you will need a printer, or two, you will need a Sizzix cutting machine. If you don't have a Sizzix cutting machine, then you'll need a printer, um, and you will need to download my free hexi, one inch hexi template from my free tutorials page on my website. Once you've done that, you will need to print that out onto some lightweight card, a little bit like this, or really good quality printer paper, something slightly thicker than you'd be used to printing on. You want these papers to have a wee bit of um, robustness to them. And you need in total 48 hexagon papers um, printed out and then accurately cut out with scissors. If you um, do have a Sizzix, like this one, a Sizzix Big Shot, you will need the one inch hexi die here. And the type of paper that you can use to put through this, which is good for um, our one inch hexagons, would be like glossy magazine covers um, or the sort of catalogs that come through the letterbox with lovely quality paper. There's another little crafting uh, brochure, some leaflets, charity leaflets there. Something with a, a decent quality to it and you can whiz those through your um, Sizzix. To cut out the hexagons using your Sizzix, take a sheet of card or your glossy paper and we'll fold it over a couple of times here. You need your one of your plastic plates underneath your die and then the four layers of paper go on top and then your second plate goes on top of that. So we want to feed those in through the left hand side of the big shot and turn the handle clockwise until it comes out the other side. And what you've got here are your perfectly cut one inch hexi papers. And if you happen to have one of these, um, a little single hole punch, they're really handy. Pop a little hole in the middle of each of your papers, whether you're printing them out or putting them through the Sizzix. And that makes it much easier to flick those out um, at the end when we're removing the papers. The process of getting the papers and the fabric together is called basting and there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. I'm going to show you two ways today. The first one is using a glue stick or a glue pen. This one is by Soline Fabric Glue Pen and it comes with a little refill stick as well which is handy and it's basically like a print stick. It's a solid um, adjustable glue pen. So what we want to do is you're going to need 48 of these in total and you can either start with 48 two and a half inch squares or you can just cut from your scraps as you go. The hexi paper goes on to the wrong side of the fabric and you can either trim off these corners to mirror the hexi shape if you want to. I don't bother, I just leave them on. Um, but you want a, a generous quarter inch seam allowance around the whole shape. So with the glue pen, you're putting some of the, the glue onto one of your edges and simply folding the fabric over that and sticking it down. And then you can work either clockwise or anti-clockwise direction 
the second stroke is going to be from the fabric onto the paper and push the fabric over until it sticks and you just carry on in the same way the whole way around the hexagon shape. Now the disadvantage of using a glue pen comes when um, we need to take the papers out at the end and unfortunately you have to peel off the fabric um, to get the paper out which is um, something I don't like doing. It disturbs the hexy shape a little bit for me um, but it is quicker at the basting stage so it's entirely up to you and um, speed your thing you may prefer to use the glue pen. The other way to um, baste our hexagons is to sew the paper and fabric together. So for this you'll need a needle and thread, just a single length of thread with a really good knot on the end. And again we're going to put our hexi paper onto the wrong side of our fabric. And I'm going to fold over an edge here. And I'm going to start sewing from the right side. So we want to bring the needle near to a corner, just up here from the right side so that our knot is on the right side and our thread is now on the back and we just fold over the fabric to finish this first corner and do a little stitch in the corner like that. Now we're going to jump all the way, a big stitch all the way down to the next corner and you'll see a big stitch there on the right side and to finish the second corner here we do a little stitch. So all our little stitches will be on the wrong side and all our big stitches will be on the right side. So we keep going all the way around the hexy shape doing our little stitches in the corners Oops, and a big stitch on the right side. Big stitch, little stitch. One more big stitch and we finish the corner, the last corner with a little stitch. So all our little stitches are on the right, the wrong side and our big stitches are on the right side. Now when you cut your thread don't cut it too short. You want to leave yourself a decent amount of thread to grab hold of later on. Um, leave that just hanging like that and you've got your knot here on this side and then our tail here and later on I'll show you how we remove the basting stitches. Once you have your hexagons all basted we want to sew them um, together in four rows of 12 hexagons in each row. So I'm going to show you how we can sew two together, right sides together like that and get the edges nicely lined up. You want your hand sewing needle again a single length of thread with a good knot in the end. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to bring the needle up through the corner of this hexagon nearest to me and that buries my knot into that little corner there. And then we're just going to do a little whip stitch. So it's grabbing a little bit of the fabric from the far hexagon and the near hexagon. I'm going to do a couple of stitches just in that corner there to get started. And that anchors the start of my stitches. Then just work your way along this edge taking a little bit of fabric from each one in each stitch. And keep going until you get to the next corner. When 
when you get to the corner you just want to do a couple of stitches like you did at the start in the one place like stab stitches in the, the same corner and that's that line finished I will have to do is um, snip or thread but before we do that I'm just going to thread my needle down through this little flap of fabric here and then I can snip my thread quite close and when I open it up that's what they look like and they're almost invisible stitches. If you keep them nice and small, don't be grabbing too much fabric, then they'll be nice and discreet. So you want to keep joining them end to end um, in rows of 12, like you see here. And you need four rows of 12. Like that and you'll see they all slot together like so. Don't take your tacking stitches out just yet, keep them in. Um, and now I'm going to show you how to join the four rows together. So we're going to join all four rows together. So remember the order, which is the right, which is the left, and you're out and you're in, and you're out and you're in. So I'm going to start with the bottom two rows here, first of all. And the edges that we actually need to stitch together um, go in a zigzag line. So you can see here, we need to be sewn from there to there, then from there to there, up, down, up, down, and it goes in a zigzag edge all the way along. So you just have to remember which edges, which two edges that you need to sew together. So again, a hand sewing needle and a nice long length of thread this time with a good knot on the end. So the first um, edge that I need to sew is from here to here. So we need to put these right sides together. But when I do that, you'll see that this goes up at an angle because this was at an angle. But that's okay. So we're going to sew this edge the same way that we joined all our hexes together. I'm going to bury my little knot in the corner here on this hexie nearest to me and do a couple of stabs, stab stitches at the start. If you need to, if your thread is too short and halfway along, you need to finish off your thread. Finish on a stab stitch and restart on a stab stitch. And that's just a couple of stitches in the one place. Then sew in the same way that you did before along this edge here until I get to the next corner. Now when you get to the next corner, the end of that first edge, just do a little stab stitch and you can see what that looks like from the front. So the next edge that we have to sew is this one here. So we're not snipping our thread, we're going to leave it nice and long. But this time we're going to fold these two pieces right sides together. So we bring that down like that and that makes the row come down the way at an angle. Our thread is still attached and it's right at the start of this new line, this new edge that we have to sew together. So you just continue with your whip stitches until you get to the end of this edge. Again, at the corner here, we're just going to do a couple of stitches in the one place to secure that. And that's our first and second line done. So you just continue 
putting those two right sides together, those two right sides together, and that will give you the ability to sew that zigzaggy edge all the way to the end. And then join another row that will go in like that. So in, out, in, out. So your two ends must have staggered hexagons once they're all, all joined together. Before we remove the basting stitches um, in our hexes, you want to press the whole piece from the front and also from the back. Then we're ready to start removing these um, basting stitches. So I'm going to show you how to do that on a single hexi first, just so that it's easier for you to, to make out. So if you remember, we finished on a tail of thread here and our knot is just beside it. So from the tail, count back two big stitches. There's one, there's the second one. And just pull that back like that. There's our tail. Then go round to the knot and give that a tug. And there's our thread completely out. Now it's really easy to flip out the paper with um, the little hole that we created in them and we retain the, the hexy shape. Give it another press. You may also want to spray starch the back of it a little bit, the whole panel, um, just to keep it nice and crisp. So I have taken all my papers out and I've spray starched it on the back and I've also spray basted it onto a piece of heavy sewing violin which is a little bit bigger than my panel that's available in my shop but just a little note on the papers keep your papers because you can reuse those over and over again and um, just give them a little press with the iron to flatten them out again and they are um, completely usable for um, several times over so now we need to quilt our panel um, with hexagons, there's some natural lines and grids within them that I like to use. So if you imagine a ruler running from here, picking up that line there, through that hexi, picking up that line, through that hexi, picking up that line, there's natural lines that you can connect. Once I, did, I do that line, then I can do the next one and the next one and the next one. And I'll do that in that direction and I'll also do it in the opposite direction so that you'll get a diagonal grid appearing on your panel. Also, you may want to consider attaching an applique foot if you happen to have one for your machine. It has a bigger opening here, a bigger window to view, so it may, makes it easier. I'm not going to draw the lines on here, but it makes it easier for me to stitch in the ditch. I can see really um, clearly where the ditch is, and then I can just um, eyeball the line from there to there and pick up the next stitch as I go along. So the applique foot will just give you a bigger window to facilitate that. I'm going to show you just a few lines of quilting. I have my applique foot on, a 90 needle in my machine, and I've increased my stitch length to a number three. So I'm going to start fairly centrally, a central diagonal line in my panel, and I'm going to start at the top of a hexi here. And I'm going to cut through the hexi and then pick up the ditch, just so right in the middle of the ditch. Carry on through this hexi onto the next stitch and so on until we get to the end of this particular line. So the end of the line will be the edge of this hexagon here so I can actually just stop there. And I'll snip my thread. and start back up at the same top edge here. So there's my first line. So the next line is about an inch, I suppose, over. And we're gonna be starting at the top of this hex again. Cutting through and picking up the next 
stitch and this line will be running exactly parallel to the first line of stitching that we've just done. And I can stop there. So keep going um, to one side, working all your stitches to one side, remembering to start at the same edge that you start at each time and then do the other side and then I'll show you what to do next. So here you can see all my quilting lines, the whole panel has been quilted and they're all running nicely parallel this way through the ditches and the hexes. So now what we want to do is pick up our lines of the grid going this way. So it's the same technique, start at the top of a hexi, cut through it, pick up the ditch, cut through the next hexi, pick up the ditch and so on. Starting at the same top edge, um, working one side and then working to the other side. My exterior panel has now been completely quilted um, in both directions. Hold this a bit closer to let you see it. And you've got this lovely little grid happening and in the middle of each hexi you've got this um, X shape secondary pattern there. So that's a completely quilted. Now what we need to do is to trim our two long sides. So I'm going to put the panel this way and you want to line your ruler up with the little indentations here, the little narrowest parts of our edge, which means we're trimming off the tops of all of our hexagons here. So I'm just lining the ruler up all the way from there, all the way to that one. And we'll cut that side off first. For the other side, what I recommend you do is place that on a line on the ruler, um, on the mat, sorry, before we um, cut the other side because we want to make sure that um, our next cut is exactly parallel to this one. So again, I'm going to put my ruler to the narrowest parts of the hexagons there, but I also just want to double check I'm getting um, five and a half width here. So I wanna make sure that this cut is exactly parallel to this edge. So I'm using the half inch line here on the ruler lined up and I'm going to cut on this side. There we go. So that's our two long edges nicely straight and parallel. With the short ends, you can see that um, we have the, the out and the in and the out and the in format here. What we do is we take a pair of small scissors and we're gonna just snip the excess violin away carefully as you can without cutting into any of your stitches or your hexagons and little small embroidery scissors let you get nice and close especially into the little corners there. Just one little thread there. like that. So that's how we want to finish each edge and then I'll show you how to join those edges together. So I have both ends of my panel trimmed, the excess violin trimmed away. So both ends have this in and out um, zigzaggy shape and that means when we bring those two ends together like so they just fit neatly together like a little jigsaw slotting together, the in and the out slotting together there. And what that means is we are going to sew these edges right sides together. And if we start, it's a little bit like sewing the hexagon rows together. We start with the first edge here and we bring those right sides together like that. 
and I'm going to bring this closer so you can see you really want the just to be lifting the fabric of the hexagons with your needle and thread as you sew this little edge here try not to um, get any of the violin there on the outer edge you really just want to be grabbing the fabric on the the inner layers there and um, single needle and thread again with a good knot on the end and a whip stitch just from that corner to that corner don't tie off your thread um, and then what you'll be doing is turning the piece so that you can do the next set of edges so I've sewn this first edge here and I'll just show you I've grabbed the fabric, missed most of the violin there and this is what it looks like from the other side, the right side. So now we need to do this edge here. So we crease that a little bit on the right hand side and bring those two edges together there. And I've still got my thread attached so I can just carry on from where we left off grabbing the fabric of the hexagons and trying to miss the violin as much as we can and just doing a little whip stitch all the way to the next corner and then when that's done we'll be turning it again to do the next edge and so on until it's all joined together. So there we have our short end joined. You can just about see my joining seam there and from the right side that's what it looks like there somewhere along there. So hopefully you've been able to disguise the, the join. Um, give it a little press just to settle down any lumps and bumps and now we're ready to make the base. I have already worked out what size circle you will need to draw for um, the base for this size of a basket, this size cylinder. At the end of the tutorial um, I will have instructions and a formula for how you can work out the base size for any basket that you want to make. But for this particular size one, you need to draw a circle with a radius of three and five eighths. Now you will need a compass for this and the radius is the distance from the middle of a circle out to one edge. So I've already calculated that you need um, a distance from here to here of three and five eighths. So on your um, cutting mat or on a ruler, you can measure three, one, two, three, and then five eighths is five of these little dashes, one, two, three, four, five. So that is the size of our radius. So I'm going to put my compass in the middle of a sheet of paper Oops, and draw a circle. So if you cut that out with a pair of paper cutting scissors then what you do is you pin that onto your base fabric and cut it out. Seam allowances are already included so don't be adding any extra on. You just want to cut it um, exactly the same shape as the paper circle and you also need the same size cut out from a piece of the heavy sewing violin. Now when you have those two cut out, on the fabric um, circle I want you to iron it in half, in half again and again so that it's divided into eighths and you can see those crease lines there, they're going to be our quilting lines. So if you spray baste the fabric onto the violin and then quilt along all of those lines that will be our base made. There's my uh, finished quilted base. So what we're going to do now is we're going to make the piping. 
that is going to fit all the way around that and I like to add piping to these little baskets because um, it finishes them nicely but also it gives them a little bit more definition helps it to sit up nice as a little basket cylindrical shape too so it's a little bit of work involved I'm going to show you how to make it and attach it but it's definitely worth it to um, add the finished look to these little baskets so the um, length of your panel, your side panel here, is the same length of um, piping cord that you're going to need. So for this shape basket, um, it was 21 and a half, 21 and three, it's 21 and a half inches. So that's the length of cord that you would cut. And this is quarter um, inch, um, roughly five millimeter cord. And that will be um, exactly enough. If you want to just be on the safe side, add an, an extra half inch, but that will get you all the way around um, this base. Now, we're going to wrap this cord in bias binding. And you need half inch bias binding, which is not, half inch is the finished measurement of it. And what actually we'll be doing is opening up um, the binding, folding it over and our piping cord will absorb the quarter inch nearest to the fold and then our seam allowance that's left will be a quarter of an inch. Now if you don't have a half inch bias binding to hand but it's bigger you have some like me you have some in a prettier color that blends more nicely with your fabric but it's wider this one's three quarter of an inch wide you can still use that so we'll be doing the same technique opening it up and putting the cord in here and that will absorb a quarter of an inch um, and then all we do is we trim this back to a quarter inch seam allowance. Our seam allowance must be a quarter of an inch because that is the measurement of the formula in working out the size of the base. So anything, any bias binding that is half an inch or bigger will work. Cut your bias binding the same length as your cord. And to attach the cord into the bias binding, you either need a piping foot or an adjustable zipper foot. Now, if you have a faff, the number four foot is the zipper foot. And you put it on this way, you, the number four should be the right way up. You don't want to attach it that way round. And you want to clip the foot onto the machine on the left hand side of the foot. like so and then bring your needle all the way out to the left hand side so that it's flush with the left side of the foot and that means we'll keep our cord and our fabric out to the left hand side as well. Pop your cord into your um, opened out bias binding. We've got the cord pushed right up to the folded side and then our raw edges of our binding are aligned here and I just like to stitch, put a couple of stitches across the top to stop the cord accidentally getting pulled out as we're working with it. Um, you can hand stitch that or just run it through the machine. And position the zipper foot, the side of the zipper foot right up, pushed up against the bulk of the, the piping. You want that to be really, really close. You don't want any gap, any gaping between the cord and the the bias binding. And just slowly work your way down the length of the bias binding, creating the bulk there at the, the left hand side where your piping is. Now you want to stop sewing um, a generous half inch um, at the bottom here just to leave yourself a little bit of unsewn bias binding um, for when it comes to doing the join. So this is my um, stitched piece of piping now. Um, you can see that the seam allowance here is way too big because my bias binding was um, bigger than what I needed. So um, I'm just going to trim this down to a nice 
scant quarter inch seam which is about the same distance um, the same width of the piping there and just carefully um, cut away all that excess. Pin the piping onto the outer edge of the base. The end that you stitched across the cord, um, that end you want to start with um, and start pinning from there clockwise all the way around. But we're not actually going to sew right from the edge of that piece. You want to start sewing about an inch and a half down from there. And um, while our seam allowance is a quarter of an inch, you're, you've still got your zipper foot in. You actually want to be pushing um, Again, like the way you attach the cord in, you want the zip edge of the zipper foot to be nice and snug up against the edge of the cord. Um, and just take your time going all the way around. You want to stop a couple of inches short of where you started sewing, just to give us room to do the, the little join. join the ends of our piping um, the edge that you finish sewing on um, has the piping um, a little bit free of the end of the cord so pull that back exposing the cord and we want to overlap the two ends of the cord here so that we know where to trim so if I have them in position and overlap there I'm going to trim the longest piece level with the starting piece of cord, which is there. Like so. So now they are going to just butt nice and neatly together there. So then we can bring our um, folded down edge all the way up. And you just want to fold under the little quarter inch excess that you have there. Just finger press that in. Insert the um, sealed end of your piping all the way up into there and wrap the folded edge of the binding around it and we will definitely want to pin that in place before we take it back to the machine starting a couple of stitches back and finishing a couple of stitches beyond where we started sewing. This is a little bit fiddly so do take your time to get that just right. So that's our piping completed on our base. There's my join and what you do then is you snip into the seam allowance at one centimetre intervals all the way around the circle and that will allow the bulk of the fabric to fan out inside the seam and to sit nice and flat. Now you take your exterior cylinder and make sure it's the wrong side out and what we're going to do is lay it flat and make sure you know which is the bottom edge and which is the top edge if you're using some directional fabric. I'm going to put a little pin there and I'm going to put a little pin in the opposite side. Then I'm going to turn it the other way and line up those two pins. And that gives me the center point that way and the center point that way. Now those four points are really important. When you're setting a circle into anything 
you don't just start at one edge and fade it in, fade it in all the way around because you'll find that you've got too much fabric left at the other end. You always start with the two, um, the centre axes, so the centre that way and the centre that way. And fortunately for us, we also have those lines marked on our base with the quilting line, so that makes it really easy to match up our pins to the, the four centres. So just start with one of your pins here and I'm going to put this pin onto this line and I'm going to pin into the seam allowance of my piping. Now we're starting off by pinning from this side because it's easier but in a minute and we're going to switch our pins around to the other side and I'll explain why. So that's that one done, then you do the opposite one to it next. So if we turn it round, that one's now at the bottom and this opposite pin goes in the opposite line and again just pin in the seam allowance. So that's our those two opposite centre lines done. Then you do the same with the other two pin markers with the other two centre quilting lines. So that one in. And that's that one in. And you can see already that it's starting to just fit perfectly into the base. So now all that's left to do is just to put one more pin um, in the spaces in between just to close up the rest of the gaps and it's all just fitting together really really beautifully last one There we go. Now, we actually want to sew from this side when we want to sew this in. And the reason for that is because the stitch line that you can see here, which is where we attached our piping, we actually want to be sewing just a little bit to the left of it. We want to get even closer than what we did when we put the cord in. So this is our guideline, you can't see that from this side. So that's why we're going to now transfer all our pins to this side um, and then we're going to take it to the machine and we're keeping our zipper foot in. We're going to push the zipper foot even further um, to into the bulk of the piping so that we're just over the left hand side of that stitch line. So I've moved my pins round from the first side into the inside edge here, um, keeping them in the same position. So everything's nice and evenly set in. Um, and now we're going to take it to the machine and um, we're going to sew just the other side of that stitch line that we can see there. Just get my needle all the way out to the left. And you're really just going to have to fight with this a little bit. You want to push the fabric really well into the zipper foot to make sure that you're getting over that line. And take your pins out as you go. All right, just lost my position there. There we go. And you think you're getting quite close, but push it another, another little bit. Be really quite determined with it.
when you've got all the way around it, turn it through and just check that you've caught all your binding in and that you can't see any of those previous stitch lines and that it all looks nice and neat and that there's no real gaping in between the binding and the fabric either side but it's all nice and um, flush. So that's our external basket um, made and ready then for us to make the lining. To make the lining of our basket you need two pieces. You need your long side panel and you need um, a circle for the base. So the long side panel I have joined the short ends right sides together um, with a quarter inch seam allowance and pressed my seam open. And then what I've done from that side I have folded it and marked with a pin and that will be my centre axis there and I've done the same the other way like that and also marked with pins here and here um, just so that it makes it easier for setting in the base and the base you use your same template that you use for the exterior base and you cut out your lining circle and this time we only need to iron it in half and then in quarters and that will give us our center axes which we will match up with our pins in setting in the base and you set the the base of the lining in um, exactly the same way that you set the base of the exterior basket in just without the piping this time don't leave any gaps we're not turning anything through just pin it from your four center points first then the gaps in the middle and then a quarter inch seam the whole way around so here you can see i have pinned in the base into the side panel and um, i've put some of my pins in vertically in the gaps and now i can just pin it um, and sew it from this side unlike the exterior basket we needed to switch our pins around and sew it from the inside we don't need to do that this time with the lining so it's pinned on the outside and we can sew it from the outside So there we go, that's our base in. What I'll do now um, is snip into the um, curve seam um, at one centimetre intervals all the way down to our stitches and um, try and obviously not to cut into your stitches. And then that's our lining ready to set into our exterior basket. So now we're ready to put our lining inside our exterior basket but first we have to do um, a little bit of pinning so we open this up this way so that we can find the um, centre points on that axis and the same again this way match up the pins and two more centre points So that's that one marked up and then we do the same with the lining so I'll just start at my side seam that can be one I'll not pin that because that's already um, defined and then we'll bring it the other way match the pin to the seam and we'll get our other two center points and you know what's coming next we want to match our um, pins on our lining to our pins on our exterior. Now just be careful setting this in, just watch out for the pins. But first of all we're going to start matching up um, our pin markers and you can pin from the outside this time. And 
and this is just getting the lining initially into the right position but we're going to do a wee adjustment in a minute so these pins may not be permanently positioned last one over here okay now what you do you push the base right down into the very bottom and you want to get the two seams this the seam of the exterior and the seam of the lining really pushed in to each other you don't want the base sitting up slightly get all that fabric pushed well down into that seam then what I do is I start to flatten the fabric on the sides the lining fabric I start to flatten it on the sides and I'm going to pin in the middle and don't worry about ugly um, folds and excess fabric happening up at the top here we will address that in a minute so I'm just smoothing out the sides on the inside and any excess that we have will gradually make its way up to the top and I think the reason why there's a little bit of excess and you'll see it in a minute is I think because we don't have piping on the linings in the lining seam so it's not absorbing just as much fabric I'll do one more okay so be careful not to pull the base up when you're doing that it's sitting nice and flat on the bottom there but if I remove our first set of pins which were our four center points now and I'm just going to let the rest of that fabric work its way up to the top and then I can start to repin the top edge one more should do it and it's fitting exactly but you can see there on both sides there's a little bit of excess lining and we'll just check once more inside it's looking nice and flat on the base and there's no puckering at the sides so what I would do now is I'll take my scissors and I'll just very carefully trim away that little bit of excess lining then I'm going to machine tack along this top edge. Machine tacking is just a nice big stitch on your machine and keeping the needle really close to the edge within a quarter inch seam allowance so much less than a quarter of an inch about an eighth of an inch in and that will just hold all, all of that top edge together. You can do that first if you want and then trim it off um, either way whatever works for you and then we'll have a nice neat top edge ready for putting in our binding. So that's my lining um, put into my basket. I've machine tacked along this top edge here, trimmed away the excess and everything is looking nice and neat and tidy. So the last thing to do is to put on our binding. Now this isn't bias binding. This is fabric cut on the straight of the grain and these are two and a quarter inch wide strips. Because there's no wadding in this, it doesn't absorb as much of the binding fabric. So two and a quarter wide is fine. I have shorter strips here which I've just joined with a wee quarter inch seam and press that seam open and then you iron the whole strip in half lengthways with the wrong sides together so that your binding now looks like that. So we're going to attach the binding onto the outside of our basket first and we leave a little bit free so I don't start sewing from the very end I'll start sewing maybe four or five inches along and we're just using a quarter inch seam allowance you will need to increase your stitch length here um, just because we have several layers of fabric so up to about a three or a three and a half So stop sewing um, several, about four or five inches before where you started and we're going to um, join the two ends of the fabric um, 
and then we can just finish off attaching the rest of the binding. To join the ends of our binding fabric, um, we the starting strip, the end of it needs to be within the gap that we've left. So I'm just going to trim a tiny bit off that so that the edge of that first piece of binding is within our gap. Then we're going to bring the bit that we finished on over the top of it and you want everything to be nice and flat but you also want to be able to see the end of the first bit of binding and we're going to measure a half an inch from the end of that underneath piece of binding out this way. So there's half an inch and we'll draw our line and that's where we trim just on this piece of binding only, not through the underneath piece. And that gives us a half inch overlap between the two ends of our binding. So if we open those out like this and put the two right sides together and we'll put a wee pin in that to hold it. That means if we sew across that edge with a quarter inch seam, then our binding will fit exactly the gap left in our basket and we'll be able to finish sewing down the binding. So I've joined the two ends of my binding with a quarter inch seam and just finger pressed that little seam open. And when I settle the fabric back down into that edge, the top edge of the basket, that's just going to um, finish off that gap so I can carry on sewing a couple of stitches back from where I stopped and a couple of stitches beyond where I started. There we go, that's our binding on. Flip it up like that. If you can manage to press that up, um, do so using the end of the ironing board. If not, don't worry. Um, what we're gonna do now, you can either hand stitch this down here with an invisible applique stitch, or you can do it on the, the sewing machine um, in the ditch from the front side. And to do that, push your binding over to the back and pin in the ditch where you're going to be sewing and check the back of it. I'll go a little fold there. If you see that the fabric, the pin has caught the binding at the back, then as long as you stitch where you've pinned, you'll catch the underside of the binding because you'll be stitching it from this side. You won't see what's going on in the, the underneath part. So put your pins in and check every one and if you've caught the binding in then you'll be fine. I've my binding pinned on and checked at the back so I'm ready to stitch in the ditch now. If you have a stitch in the ditch foot it looks a little bit like this. It has a metal guide right in the middle of it and that's what you would um, keep in the seam your eye would follow the guide and not the needle behind it. If you don't have a ditch foot, um, but you do have an applique foot, then that also works very well because you've got a much more bigger window, uh, a viewing window there to see where exactly where the needle is in the ditch. And if you have neither, then you can still stitch in the ditch with a standard foot. Just take your time and making sure that the needle stays in the ditch. The ditch is the lower level right beside the binding. Your needle will be butting up against the binding but it will actually be stitching on the lower level on the hexes just below it. And your needle must be in the middle position to use um, a stitch in the ditch foot. And 
and there we have our binding in all the way around and stitched in the ditch and that's your basket finished So if you want to make a different size basket to the one that we've just made in the tutorial, there are two different ways that you can work out your calculations for um, what size base you need and what size of a side panel that you need. So it's the same formula, but we move the um, elements around a little bit depending on whether you're starting with a side panel, a little bit like one that I've made here, or you may decide that you want to start with a, a size of a base. I've got a saucer here and you may think, yeah, that's the size that I want to make it. We can work out from either um, standpoint um, the measurements for the rest of the basket. So first of all, the first formula that we need, um, we're going to look at um, from the side panel. So let's say you've been just merrily sewing away and you've created a panel um, um, roughly the size that you think you might, you might like. And I have just appliqued on some hexes onto this panel. And this is 19 inches in length. Now the length of our panel is actually our circumference of our basket. So let me talk you through the anatomy of a circle. So C is going to be our circumference which is all the way around the circle, the outer edge of the circle. D is diameter which is cutting across the middle of our circle. And then R is from the middle of D out to either side. So if we go from here to here, that is R. R is always half of D. So those are the, the component parts of a circle. The last component part you may remember from school days, something called pi. And that's the ratio between the circumference and the diameter. Pi is always 3.14 something, 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 something. But for our purposes, we'll just stick with 3.14. So once we know this, and once we know some of those elements, we can work out the bit that's missing. So for example, the formula that we need from starting with a side panel is D equals C over pi. So we want to know what our diameter is. We want to know what this is so that we can put our compass on a piece of paper and draw a circle to create the size of base that we need. So what information do we have? Well, we have the circumference. Now, the circumference here is 19 inches, but then we have to take off our seam allowance because I would actually be sewing the short ends of this panel together using a quarter of an inch. Two quarter inches is half an inch. We would actually have to subtract a half an inch from the 19 inch length that we have here. You don't need to do that if you are working from a completely um, EPP'd panel um, because there are no seam allowances when you join the ends like we did in our tutorial. In that instance your circumference is just the length of one of your rows. So C here would be 19 minus 0.5. Okay so that's the first part of our equation. We know what pi is so we're going to divide 18.5 by 3.14. That equals 5.89. And there's lots of decimal points after that. So D, our diameter all the way across the middle of our circle here, is 5.89. And this is inches. But what we actually want is R. So we're going to divide that by 2, which gives us. 2.95 which would be from there to there. Now what you have to remember at the very end of this is to add on a quarter of an inch seam allowance. You can either add it on a half an inch onto diameter or you can add a quarter inch onto radius. 
So if we add our plus 0.25, we get 3.19, and I could actually round that up to 2. 3.2 inches. Now that's just sneaking under um, three and a quarter inches. Three and a quarter inches would be 3.25. Um, so we might want to take that down by about an eighth of an inch. So maybe three and one eighth of an inch. And that would be the measurement that you would put your, your compass. You would work out three and one eighth of an inch from point to pencil and then you would draw your circle. And that will be the size of your base, including a seam allowance that will fit whatever size panel that you have made. The second way of working out our basket measurements is to start with a base size. And what you want is the diameter of the circle that you have. So you put your tape measure across the middle of your circle. We've got eight and a half inches here on this one, on this plate. So this time we have um, a, a slightly different formula. It's the same elements, but we're going to just change the um, letters around a little bit. And this time what we need to work out is um, circumference, which is going to be the length of our panel. So it's going to be C equals D times pi. So we've just taken the measurement of D with our tape measure. That was eight and a half. And we're going to multiply that by pi. 26.69. Now that does equal C, but that's the finished size of our circumference. So because we're working backwards now, we need to add on a half inch seam allowance if you're going to make a panel where you join the two short ends together with a quarter inch seam. If you're doing an EPP panel where there's no um, seam allowance, um, that is the measurement that you would need for your, your panel. So if we add on a half an inch, 27.19 is C, is the, the length of the panel that we need. And uh, again, if you look at the decimal points there, we're just under a quarter, um, 0.25 would be a quarter of an inch. So I would probably take that down to about an eighth of an inch. Um, so 27 and one eighth of an inch would be the length of the panel that I would make and quilt. The height of these panels can be anything you want them to be. It really depends on how deep you want your baskets to be. So that would be your other, your other measurement, allowing for some seam allowances being used um, where the piping goes in. I hope you had fun with my tutorial. If you'd like lots more inspiration, free tutorials, patterns and classes, do check out my website. You can also follow me on Instagram and Facebook. Mm -hmm.